don't think there's going to be time today to uh, show you my pictures of the uh, little time I had in uh, Yellowknife, so I'll just take two minutes now to say that last weekend I preached at uh, our uh, namesake church, Holy Trinity, uh, in Yellowknife, uh, our uh, prayer partner church with Trinity, and it was a marvelous opportunity. Um, it's a, it's a fascinating congregation, uh, reminded me much of Trinity in many ways. They have a hunger for the Word and a desire to uh, follow Jesus, a prayerful place. Um, one of the things that was noteworthy for me was the multi-ethnicity of the congregation. I counted six obvious ethnic uh, groups present. Um, the pastor told me there were actually 11. I wasn't able to discern the differences between some of the Aboriginal communities that were present. Um, so Yellowknife is this uh, one city in the whole uh, Northwest Territories. Uh, there's only one city, it's the capital. The whole Northwest Territories is four million square kilometers. And of that, uh, in that whole space, uh, there's only 55,000 people. So I think there's more people in Sarnia than there are in the entire Northwest Territories. The Diocese of the Arctic includes even more than that. It includes both Northwest Territories, Yukon, Nunavut, and Northern Quebec, right up to the uh, right up to the border with Labrador. So it's a very, very big area. Uh, Bishop David takes care of 45 communities spread over these four million uh, square kilometers. Um, it was uh, a great opportunity for worship and, uh, and preaching, and uh, I really am feeling very privileged to have been there. That's all I can say today. Uh, but I will, I will say a little more uh, later, or another day. So we've been working our way through uh, Romans, and uh, I know that Romans is a challenging read. Uh, Paul does lots of run-on sentences, and the book is filled with big theological words like redemption and sanctification and justification and imputed righteousness and all sorts of big words. And it's tough going for preachers. Now last week, David preached on chapters, end of half, second half of chapter 2 and chapter 3. Today I'm to take on chapters 4 and the very first verse of 5. The theme, the topic of what David said last week and what I'm going to say this week are very similar. Very similar, except that Paul takes a different tack in the reading we just heard. Instead of explaining in theological categories, he explains using the illustration of the life of Abraham. Um, and so what I'm going to try to do today, I'm going to ask you to uh, use your imaginations. I'm going to try to get at this tough text in a different way. Now, I've done this with you before. I've uh, asked you to kind of uh, participate with me in an exercise that we would call the sanctified use of imagination. So you're going to you're gonna do some pretending, and I'm going to try to take you back, okay? So out here is the Mediterranean Sea, and I'm on a balcony. Over there, you got two men having a conversation. So you're on the balcony of a large upper room, a sort of studio apartment. Two men are at work at a table inside this apartment, but you see this spectacular view of the Aegean Sea, the Mediterranean, blue sh sea and sky and ships and, and whitewashed buildings in the foreground, sailing ships and galley ships rowed by slaves. One of the great commercial port cities of the Mediterranean, of the ancient world, is stretched out before you. Uh, and this is, of course, Corinth on the uh, Greek peninsula. Corinth is a place where the peninsula narrows down. The isthmus of Corinth is only four miles across, and then the peninsula gets wider again. So ships would take their cargo by land over this four-mile isthmus rather than sailing all the way around. So it's a place where east-west cargo travels and north-south cargo travels. And Corinth truly is an intersection city between the people of the Eastern Roman Empire and the Western Roman Empire, a city of commerce, 
a busy port city. And it's from here that Paul writes his letter to the church at Rome. So from your vantage point, above the street below, you can feel the pulse of the ancient city. Children running, <coughs> vendors and merchants competing for the attention of passers-by, the chatter of hundreds of voices mingling together. Your attention is drawn back into the apartment where these two men are speaking. One is speaking confidently and boldly, and the other appears to be taking dictation. With great care, he makes large letters upon parchment with a practiced rhythm. He inks Greek characters that record the words of the man who's now pacing around furiously. There is a drivenness, an intensity about this pacer. He is focused, a man with no time for interruptions or small talk. He speaks with confident words. He knows exactly what he wants to say, though sometimes he pauses to find the right language to convey his thoughts. You know this man, you've met him before, uh, not in person, but in the pages of Holy Scripture, and of course he is Paul, the apostle of the heart set free. Once Saul of Tarsus, now Paul. Paul's anamnusis, or secretary, is named Tertius. He's a Hebrew Christian, uh, a member of the congregation of the church at uh, Corinth. Now, Paul apparently lived next door to the synagogue in Corinth for 18 months and uh, lived there due with the hospitality of another Christian named Justice. It's from here, scholars think, he wrote his letter to the church in Rome in the year 57. The Roman church, not a church planted by Paul, is thought to have had a large Jewish congregation, both Jews and Gentile Christians worshiping in the same church. Paul writes conveying his gospel to the church at Rome because he hopes for their support as he takes a mission further west uh, into Spain. <coughs> so Paul says, write this, Tertius. No human being will be justified in God's sight by works of the law, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been made visible apart from law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God is through faith for those who believe. Tertius sort of screws up his face and he says, Paul, I get it. I'm convinced God deals with us by grace, giving himself, giving us right standing with him through Christ. But this is a difficult concept, especially for us Jews. All our lives has been hammered into our heads that it's by observing the commandments and keeping Torah, law, that we gain right standing with God. If God deals with us the way you say by grace, simply giving away righteousness to everyone who trusts in him, what was the point of the law, anyway? What was the point of all the rules and regulations of Torah? Is there any point at all, or purpose at all, to all of this effort and obedience my people have been through for the last 1,500 years? We see Paul pause on the patio as he paces back and forth. And he looks over the balcony. I'm just guessing here, I have no idea. This is how I think it happened. He's looking over the balcony and he sees a clothesline strung between, I don't know if they had clotheslines either, but I'm kind of, you know, sanctified use of the imagination, okay? And he sees washing strung out on a line and he says, it's sort of like this. The only way you can know if that garment's been washed properly, that white garment, is by hanging the wash garment up against a brand new white garment and compare the color. And it's only by seeing the standard of the one that you can tell if the other one measures up to the standard. And that's what the law is about. 
The law sets up a standard of God's perfect righteousness. And when you look at the law, you can tell whether you measure up or not. And you know, because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that you don't measure up. So you need a Savior. You need Jesus. And then maybe he sees construction going on and says, Tertius over there, you see that building being built? How do they know if that wall is vertical? <coughs> Tertius would say they use a plumb line. God's law is like a plumb line. It sets up God's righteous, perfect standard so that you know whether you measure up or not. But there's a problem with the law, Paul would say. The problem is, although the law can tell you right from wrong and show you where you fail to measure up, the law cannot change hearts. <clears throat> Human behavior doesn't change just because of rules and regulations. How long have we had the law? Churches would fumble around and say maybe 1,500 years. And then Paul would say, and has human nature changed? Are we any different because we've got rules than before we had rules? Tertius, the point of the law is to make us know that we have sinned. And to make us know that only God can forgive sin and to send us to Jesus Christ on our knees. Now, Tertius, write this down before I lose the thought. Where does this leave our proud Jewish insider claims to have a sort of inside track with God? We, the chosen people, where does that leave us? All that privilege is canceled. What we've learned is this. God does not respond to what we do. We respond to what God does. We've got this figured out at last. Our lives get in step with God and others by letting him set the pace, not by proudly or anxiously trying to run the parade. <clears throat> so where does this leave our Jewish claims of having a corner on God? Also canceled. God is the God of the outsider. He is the God of non-Jews as well as Jews. How else would we make sense of the fact there's only one God? Tertius writes with deft strokes, trying to catch up, and then he looks up and says, Paul, I need to interrupt you. This is deep, heavy going. I don't think your readers in Rome are going to get it. I'm having trouble keeping up, and I'm right here. I can interrupt you and ask questions. It's just too abstract. It's just too heavy. Paul says, let me try to lighten up. I'll give you an illustration. Tertius, this is as old as Israel. God hasn't changed. He hasn't suddenly become gracious. God loves, delights in giving people what they don't deserve, love and mercy. Look at the Psalms of David. King David knew that the forgiveness he so badly needed, he was not entitled to, and it could only come to him as a gift. <clears throat> And so David received this gift of cleansing from God, enabling him to be a wonderful king. Even his son Solomon, conceived in sin, was a mighty ruler over Israel by grace. Right standing with God is a gift received by faith, and that's how it's always been. Jerusalem says, I'm sure you're right, Paul, and I get it. But this still feels like a newfangled idea to my Jewish ears. I can see Paul pausing to think, how do I speak to Tertius? How do I speak to the Hebrew-speaking Christians, the ones raised under Torah? How do I help them to understand this? He says, this is no in innovation. Salvation by grace through faith is as old as the Holy Scriptures. It's old, it's older than the Scriptures. It's as old as Abraham, that's it. It's as old as Father Abraham. Every Jew knows that Abraham was faithful under testing. Every Jew sees Abraham as his father, the first man of the chosen race to receive the mark of circumcision, the first man to enter into Torah covenant. Where they go wrong is this. 
They think God's favor towards Abraham is a consequence of his obeying the law. They think of the covenant as some sort of legal contract between equals. They think Abraham did his part by obeying, and therefore God keeps his end of the bargain by blessing him, calling him righteous. But there's a fundamental flaw. This covenant that God made with Israel is not a covenant between equals in which if humans do their part, or even one human does his part, God's obliged to do his part. Men and women can't give God anything that he needs. So you can't cut a deal with God the way you do in the marketplace. You don't trade some law-obeying obedience good behavior for God's favor. God gave promises to Abraham and his descendants as gifts. Not because Abraham was obeying the law, but because he loved Abraham. So Abraham received the promise by faith. What pleased God about Abraham was not his obedience, but his capacity to believe and trust God, even when believing and trusting didn't make any sense. Tertius, he says, write this down. In hope, Abraham believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations, as he had been told, so shall your descendants be. He didn't weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, because he was almost a hundred years old. Or when he considered the deadness of Sarah's womb, no distrust made him waver concerning the promises of God, because he grew strong in his faith and gave glory to God, convinced fully that God was able to do what he had promised. And this is why his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. It's the same for you and for me, Tertius. The words, and write this, Tertius, the words, it was reckoned to him as righteousness, were written not for Abraham's sake alone, but for yours and mine. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him who raised Jesus Christ from the dead, put to death for our trespasses, raised for our justification. And as we believe this, it will be reckoned to us as righteousness as well. You can see Tertius scratching his head, and he says, well, was it all grace? Didn't law play some part, some even small part, in God's acceptance of Abraham? After all, Abraham was the first person in our tribe, the first Hebrew, to receive the mark of circumcision. <coughs> Read your Bible, Tertius. Abraham was 75 when God gave him the promise, 99 when he was circumcised. God justified, called Abraham righteous, 24 years before he received the mark of circumcision. Circumcision was not the way he was put right with God. It was Abraham's obedient response to God in, in faith. It's just as baptism is for us. Baptism doesn't put us right with God, but baptism is a faithful response to the loving God who's first loved us. And that's how it's always been with God. <clears throat> We're put right with God as a gift. Through grace, a gift of grace received through faith. <clears throat> this topic is not simply a theological abstraction that uh, we want to wrestle with intellectually. It's a pressing subject that all believers need to come to grips with at some level. The question, put in its most crass terms, is simply this. When the sunset of life comes, how do I know that I have the promise of eternity with God? How do I know that I'm accepted by God? That's really the crass question that needs, that's asked by every believer at some point, or everyone approaching belief, is... 
heaven, a reward God gives to people who live right and obey the rules? Or is heaven a free gift to those who will receive Jesus by faith? A lot of people think the former. There's people I speak to every day, or every week anyway, who really think God grades on a curve. You've heard it. You've heard the story. Maybe you've thought it yourself. That God kind of grades our lives by comparison with others. Uh, you hear people say, I try to live right. I don't cheat on my taxes. I'm not perfect, to be sure. But I figure I've got a passing grade. I'm at least as good as the average. Maybe a little better than some. Worse than others. If God's fair, I ought to get a, a C plus anyway. And what do they say? B's get degrees? You know, you, you kind of, you know. That would, that's how a lot of folk think. And I hear that all the time. The point of this great section of Paul's letter to the Romans is that there is only one basis for us to have confidence in our status before God. Our only hope of right standing with God is by grace through faith, grounded in relationship with Jesus Christ. God gives us what we don't deserve, and it has nothing to do with what we do. Abraham believed God could bring new life from his dead body. He was promised to have descendants as numerous as the sand on the seashore. But he was 99 years old and he considered his body almost dead. And Sarah, his wife, was way beyond uh, childbearing years. So the text says he considered the deadness of Sarah's womb and his near dead state and nothing even though these facts said it cannot be, he said, I will trust God to keep his promises. And you and I are invited to do something very similar. Saving faith is about being asked to accept by faith something that by the world's standards is impossible. Jesus was crucified and killed and dead and his stone-cold dead body, lifeless body, put in a grave. And on the third day, he was raised to new life by God, and he was seen by his friends and his church resurrected. This life-from-death story is like the life-from-death story that Abraham accepted on faith. You and I are asked to accept, to trust God, to give us new life just as he gave Jesus new life and as he gave new life to Abraham and Sarah. It's a leap of faith to trust that God can do the impossible, <clears throat> but that's the leap that God asks of us and then he reckons that to us, that trust, that belief <coughs> as righteousness. Can you believe it? Will you believe it? My prayer is that you do believe it and will live by that uh, unbelievable truth. I've said these things to you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.